come tonight to tell you a bit about circuit writing and to help understand how, how that uh, helped form our communities. And, and yet, my great-grandson did not tell me that the Langston Bridge was out. <laughs> and he did not tell me also that the one over at Entrican was out. <laughs> and that there was still more detours. So, but you know, the life of a circuit rider was filled with detours. <laughs> Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me introduce myself. I am the Reverend John Henry Cornelius, and I was born in 1867 um, in County Cornwall on the southeast, southwest part of England, down on the southern shore. I was born in 1867 in a rather interesting, quaintly named town, St. Blazygate. Now, the reason was because it was at a toll gate on the road to St. Also, which was the larger city heading out toward Land's End. Now, more than a century before I was born, my ancestors had heard another circuit-riding preacher by the name of John Wesley. And, any of you heard of him? You've studied him, sir. Yes, well, very good. Well, uh, John Wesley preached all across England and, uh, and he especially came to Cornwall, and there were, there were thousands of people that would hear his open-air preaching. And among those were my relatives who became part of that Methodist movement uh, in England. Now, why, um, why would I leave home to come to America? Well, before, before I tell you that, I, I think some of you may know, why were we called Methodists? Now I know Calvinists were followers of Calvin, Lutherans were followers of Luther, uh, Methodists were followers of Methodists? Oh, okay, well, you know, when John Wesley and his brother Charles were at Oxford University, they, they were part of what they called, there was called a holy club, a, a group that met early in the morning to have Bible study and prayer, and then they regularized their week by doing things like going to visit the poor, those in the prisons, helping, helping in all manner of ways with those who were sick or, or in, in any trouble, and they did it in a methodical way. But they were called Bible moths, and they were called, uh, you know, like holier than thou, but they were also called Methodists, and I guess John Wesley thought, well, that's not a bad nickname. If you're going to do something, you might as well organize to do it, right? So anyway, that's how the Methodists got their name. And I came to America because of another traveling preacher. This one had come from America to England. Back in the 1880s, there was a man named Dwight Moody. He came from Chicago as a traveling evangelist and had great evangelistic meetings. And he talked about the opportunities in America to work with all manner of people regardless of economics or background, and, and, and I was so enthused, I wanted to go study at his Bible Institute in Chicago. So when I was just 22, I bid adieu to my family and went on board a ship and came to uh, America, to New York, and then by train to Chicago, and, and yet I didn't have the wherewithal to start at the Bible Institute. So I worked as a carriage driver for a wealthy family for a couple of years until I had saved enough for room and board. There wasn't any tuition, they wanted folks to come, but I had to have enough to keep body and soul together there in the city of Chicago. And so I went to the Bible Institute, and then when I graduated, Nellie, Helen, my, my fiance, came after waiting those four years, and we got married that fall of 1893. Oh, my goodness, when we got married in Chicago, there were thousands of people not coming to our wedding. Uh, there were so many people in Chicago that year, that summer, and into the fall, because that was the Columbian Exposition. 
And people came from all over the country and even the world. I think I read somewhere 27 million people attended that Columbian Exposition. And, and so, but we weren't there for that. Because once we got married, I was ready and determined with Nellie at my side that we were going to go into that traveling ministry. And we were going to go to Michigan. Because there was a lot of unfolding opportunities for those Methodist preachers in Michigan. Now, I... Um, that's our technology, I think. I, my my great-grandson said there's something about that that speaks out of turn, but I... I, I thought it maybe was an amen, but I... You know, I, I take, take whatever. But I... Um, I I remember in my last days, please come in, please come in. <laughs> I had just been telling the gathered congregation about how the life of a circuit rider is nothing if but detours <laughs> to make it possible to get where you needed to go. Well, in the months before I graduated from the Institute there in Chicago, before coming to Michigan, I was sweeping the stairs as part of my uh, duties at the school, and who would come down the stairs but the man himself, Dwight Moody. And, and I, I looked at him, and, and then he looked at me, and he seemed to have some sense of recognition, though, you know, he's up, across the world in his travels, and, and he's been there at the school off and on, but he put his hand on my shoulder, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, Brother Cornelius, we expect great things of you in Michigan. And so with that blessing and that encouragement, with Nellie at my side, we came to Michigan all ready to do the Lord's work, and the first place we stopped was just a little north of Battle Creek, a town called Bellevue. And I was going to be a part of an evangelistic mission. But you know, sometimes there are detours. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor at that church had gotten quite sick. And so instead of being there for just a short time and doing an evangelistic mission in different places, as I was looking forward to do, they asked me to stay. And so we stayed. And before long, our first daughter was born. And a little bit later, our second daughter was born. Uh, and Leota and Winnie, Winifred, they, they were part of our growing family when we realized that perhaps this detour was what the Lord planned, and we were going to be in circuit riding ministry in the parish, rather than an evangelistic circuit that I had originally thought. And so what happened, well let me tell you a little bit about circuits. Um, circuits are multiple churches put together so that they could have leadership from a pastor who would go from church to church to church on Sunday or whatever days worked with the distances involved. It was a long history, but when I came into Michigan, that had been going on for a long time, and so I was sent to places like Sand Lake and Pearson and Ensley Center. And, and serving those in the end of the 1800s. And then I was sent to Edmore, McBride, and Heavenway. Have you heard of Edmore? <laughs> Have you heard of McBride? <laughs> Have you heard of Heavenway? No. Oh, H-E-M-M-E-N-W-A-Y, Heavenway. There's a lake that's just off the main road about where I think my great-grandson said there's some uh, girls and their father that have some apples. Uh, Anderson. Yes. And, and so right across, there's this lake. And the lake had built up around it in the 1880s. It had a song. 
had heard Wesley, the ones that were old when I was growing up, they said that back in London, when John Wesley had built Wesley Chapel on City Road, when he looked at what was built, he said, it's perfectly neat, but not fine. And so, and so in the parlance of the day and in those days, back when they built that little church at Hemingway, they were saying, it's neat. It's just right for us. It's not too big. It's just right for us. Like this church. Just right for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. And so this little church in Hemingway was one of the three that I served in the early 1900s. And now after a sojourn further north and around places like Coleman and Gladwin, the bishop sent me to a parish back in Montcalm County, which was a county I had come to really love. He sent me to Lakeview, Belvedere, and Pleasant Hill. Now, Lakeview had started as a community in the 1860s, and they had early on a congregation meeting in the schoolhouse, which was very common for the early Methodists and other denominations to use the schoolhouses for meeting. But Pleasant Hill always was a schoolhouse. It's on, I think they call it Kendeville Road. I mean, some folks, the five corners, that's easier for people. You know. but, but you come up Kendeville Road, and, and, I, and, and there is the Pleasant Hill School, which was used during the week as a schoolhouse, and then that's where in the 1920s, that was our preaching place for the Lakeview Circuit. I, I still remember some of the children who would be eagerly waiting, watching, for my buggy to come over the hill and my high-stepping Hamiltonian horse so they could see and, and then tell the others that the preacher was, was on the way. Um, in fact, it was there in that little country school come church on Sunday that I baptized someone that I think some of you may know. They had that nice tree farm, I think. Uh, Edson uh, uh, was his, yeah, it was Larry Farnsworth. He was just a little baby when I baptized him. And, and, uh, and I, I come to understand that my great-grandson had Larry's funeral. And then the burial there at that bend in the Flat River at Langston. Hmm. It's an interesting thing how life kind of carries around in a great circle. But speaking of my great-grandson, he did ask me that I would talk about the circuit riders who, before me, had such an arduous task of taking the message from community to community in the earlier pioneer days. Oh, they had it much harder than I ever did. It wasn't uncommon for them to travel 200, 300, 400, or even 500 miles on a circuit. Think about that. Think about that. At times they preached every day. Sometimes circuits were so large it took six weeks to be able to make the circuit for the pastor to be seen. You no know, exhaustion, illness, animal attacks, and unfriendly encounters of all kinds were constant threats. You know, the leader of the American Methodists at the very beginning, when it was our nation was just established, was named Francis Asbury, and, and as a bishop, he led by example. He traveled on horseback 270,000 miles. 207, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Preaching 16,000 sermons. Oh. No, would you like to hear from some of the diaries and journals of some of those early circuit writers, would you? Would you like to hear? Okay, well let me share some of those with you. First there was Freeborn Garrison. He was known as the Paul Revere of the Methodists because he traversed that eastern seaboard at the time of the American Revolution. He was born in a wealthy family in the area of the Chesapeake Bay. His family owned slaves. And when he was converted to the faith by Methodist preachers, maybe even Francis Asbury himself, he became an abolitionist because in the Methodist tradition from John Wesley forward, 
it was known that you cannot own another person. Amen? Amen. And so he became a staunch abolitionist, and for those re that reason in his preaching, he was often jailed. You know, that can happen when we say things the community may not want to hear. Well, for the... He, he, he shared this in his journal. I was pursued by the wicked. I was knocked down. I was left almost dead on the highway. My face was scarred and bleeding, and then I was hauled off to jail. Hmm. Now, for the preacher riding the circuit, there were days and nights spent out in the elements, hunting and fishing for food, and depending on the hospitality of strangers. Anybody home? Anybody home? And they're out in the, in the wilds. You'd spend the night with whatever family would put you up. You would eat whatever was placed before you. Let me share what John Talley recalls in his diary about a meal he shared with a family. Listen. Have you, have you had supper? <laughs> good, 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 good. Well, I was fed upon musty cornbread and the tough lungs of a deer fried in rancid bacon grease and washed down with corn coffee sweetened with syrup. He, some kept careful notes, like circuit writer John Perner, who wrote about the unknown awaiting him when he stepped across the threshold of a home. After one such uh, evening, he wrote this was a good stopping place. <laughs> After another, he wrote, I'm never going to stop here again. <laughs> he, he stayed with people who were not Methodist, and he wrote, I even tried to spread the gospel to them as well. <laughs> Ministers rarely served longer than two years on the same circuit. Then they were assigned to a different one. Some said that it allowed them to recycle their sermons. That might happen. But one of the other and probably more difficult consequences was they weren't there long enough to develop the relationships and particularly with some fair person who might then become their wife. Because that it was generally thought that getting married would be a hindrance to the ministry. Well, I guess if you're going to travel like that and eat like that, I would wonder. One of the circuit riders named Isaac Boring wrote, knowing all that kind of aloneness, said, while riding through the rain and dark, with no human being with me, my soul was yet comforted on the reflection of the presence of my Savior. I felt he was near to bless and preserve me. There's determination. There's determination. Theirs was a difficult and often a short life. In the first half of the 19th century, circuit riders, half of those circuit riders didn't live past 30. Considering all those hazards that attended their journeys as well as how difficult in all the elements, particularly in a Michigan winter. That's probably why the first pension fund of the circuit riding preachers was called the Worn Out Minister's Fund. <laughs> the Worn Out Minister's Fund. Well, the circuit riders in Michigan they first arrived in the days when we were a territory in the 1830s, and then came further north to our area here in the 1850s and 60s as the first white settlements came, came here and were established. Listen to the dramatic story from the Journal of Michigan Circuit Rider Elijah Pilcher. He was in the Ann Arbor Circuit in the fall of 1830. It was a extended from just west of Detroit to about 10 miles west of Ann Arbor. That and, that and including all that part of the territory of Michigan. Settlers were then pouring into the territory and constantly pushing farther into the wilderness. 
This is what Elijah wrote. And you may recognize a name or two of a town that's a little different than today. I heard that the village of Jacksonburg had been established 40 miles west of Ann Arbor. And so I was determined to hold services there. In January 1831, I set out for the new settlement. There were but three or four houses on the way and no road to guide, to guide me. The frosty weather numbed my fingers, January. But though the blowing snow and creaking ice over frozen streams and under the frost-covered trees, I continued with determination and faith and finally made it to my destination. On the 27th of January, I inaugurated services in Jacksonburg, preaching in the bar room of a log cabin. <laughs> Jacksonburg was a wild and rough town. The inhabitants were very poor, and most of them were shaking from fever and ague. Just think. On the way back to Ann Arbor, Elijah writes, I stopped at a newly built cabin, now in what is Grass Lake, and I held services. Years later, two women, conspicuous workers in the church, informed me that they were young girls at that meeting and dated their conversion to the Christian faith and their thinking of their future to that meeting in that cabin. Before the year was out, we had over 25 appointments in that frontier circuit, embracing settlements on either side of the territorial road from Dearbornville to Jacksonburg. And circuit riders would make the rounds every four weeks. Now, over by Kalamazoo, there was a circuit rider named James Roby, who had come up from Indiana. He was born in New Jersey in 1807, and, and probably he had heard Bishop Francis Asbury preach. He came enthused to Indiana to join the Methodists there, and before long he learned that he was going to be sent to Michigan, to the Kalamazoo Mission. And he started to question his call, just this young man sent off to this, to this wilderness. The Kalamazoo Mission and Circuit was everything north of the St. Joseph River from Battle Creek to Lake Michigan. An older minister encouraged him as he left and said, the Lord's opening a door for you <laughs> in a far-off country. His first class had nine members. Oh, class was the Methodist way of talking about a, a gathering of people. They would meet, even when the pastor, the, the, um, even when the circuit rider wasn't there, they'd meet together in homes and they, they'd have fellowship and they, they would look forward to when they could then be together with the traveling circuit rider. But he started, he started classes, 26 classes, in which he would preach once every four weeks, about six or seven times a week, with meetings taking place in homes and barns and schools, wherever people gathered. And among the classes and then the churches that he founded were, were those in Galesburg, Allegan, Comstock, Climax, Schoolcraft, and Kalamazoo. In fact, James Roby was the very first minister of any denomination to preach in Kalamazoo. It was in the log cabin of the village's founder, Titus Bronson. And at that time, I believe it was called Bronson rather than Kalamazoo. But let's go further north. Let's come up to where we are. Following the course of the white settlements in the fall of 1850, there were two circuit riders, Eli Westlake and Rufus Crane, who came to the Greenville area just when things were beginning to be established. And they held services at the barn of a man, John Green. <laughs> Heard of him? Yeah. And, and some of the old timers said that some of the indigenous people who lived in the area still, they came to that service as a part of the beginnings of that church. That was part of what was called the Flat River Circuit. And the Flat River Circuit, well, it included parts of Ionia, Allegan, Kent, and Montcalm County. That was a big circuit. 
You know, these circuit-riding preachers, they brought a bit of civilization to the pioneer settlements by their itineration. They brought news from surrounding communities. In a day and age when people didn't travel very far from where they lived, they offered comfort and counsel to families in a time and a day and age where infant and maternal mortality was high. And no doubt in the weeks between a visit, there was a child who died, and maybe a mother as well. And that was part of the circuit rider's responsibility and care for that community. On a happier note, they performed weddings and baptisms and served communion, and they carried books. They carried books with them, and uh, I think that uh, one of the things I like about this coat, that uh, it's got a couple secret pockets in the tail, that uh, are a good spot for a book. Because you never know when you might be ambling along on your circuit and you might want to do some reading. But oh, let me tell you, that can have its attendant dangers if you don't watch out for a low-hanging branch. I think it was once said that John Wesley had such an experience, but he said in his journal that he was saved any injury because the book he was reading was rather thick. <laughs> you know, and of social significance, or, or rather, let me just say that I, I'm sure that there were nights around a hearth in a remote log cabin in these circuits where the preacher would break out the book or the Bible and read to a nearly illiterate family. What an important mission. And of social significance, as Methodists, the circuit riders brought with them a zeal for temperance. Abuse of alcohol in pioneer settlements was endemic. And the ensuing domestic violence and suffering of women and families was rife. And so it was a circuit rider, by his preaching and example, could offer a better way to a better society. Well, if I had time, I'd tell you about the circuit riding preacher who's buried up in Lakeview Cemetery and whose mother was the famous Michigan abolitionist, Laura Haviland, and about how once she took him when he was just a young boy uh, down to uh, 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 recover a, a daring journey to thwart gun-toting slave owners. Um, but that will have to wait for another. And so I am grateful to be with you tonight, and I thank you for gathering here and for the invitation from my great-grandson and also from the librarian here, Katie Harlan. Thank you. Yes? Did you ride a horse, or did you have a buggy, or a combination? Um, coming out of my character is my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather um, had... Um, horses for his ministry from the late 1800s through his time in Lakeview when I described him coming up over that hill on the way to Pleasant Hill with his buggy and a high-stepping Hamiltonian uh, breed of horse. It wasn't until he went to Sheridan, he served Sheridan, Fenwick, and Vickeryville um, that he bought a car. And what's interesting for me being in this area, both when Cindy and I, my wife Cindy and I were here in the 80s, and then now coming back in a serendipitous retirement, even with COVID uh, at the same time, we, we have discovered some of those stories that have been quite fun. Some of you may know Phoebe Wilson, or you know um, um, her daughter, um, Judy Edmonds, who was our um, senator. But Phoebe Wilson was a member, I believe, of the Fenwick Church. And Phoebe, when I met her, um, she said, I knew your great-grandpa. And she said, he drove too fast. <laughs> so anyway, he, he only had uh, a few years to master the horseless carriage. Uh, um, and, and evidently,
Uh, but no, uh, my great grandfather would have been <coughs> traveling by horse, but it would have been um, horse and buggy primarily. Uh, but if you go back in the stories that I shared with you from journals, they would have all been by horseback. Um, and the traveling, like Francis Asbury going from the moon and back in distance, 270,000 miles, that was all on horseback. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this is my um, great-grandfather's coat and vest. Um, and my, I'm, I'm blessed that his daughter, Winnie, my grandmother, that some of you knew, Winter Green Charlie, uh, that she kept this. Um, and, and it does. <laughs> it does. And so um, I have been blessed to then have it. And then recently my wife has uh, tucked and sewn and kept it from uh, fraying. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's nice. And it does have two pockets, one here and the other in the other tail, that children really are fascinated by. Uh, because, you know, you can be sitting and, you know, just reach back and pull out. <laughs> so. Other uh, questions? Or <clears throat> kind of a statement. I grew up around Hemingway Lake. It was about three-eighths of a mile away. And uh, in the book, the uh, ghost town of West Hill and Slaughter Hill, is that the church he was talking about? And the other thing is, in 1921 or 22, my grandfather bought, the, I believe it's the Methodist Church in Westville. Okay. And he moved it down on the farm, which we still have. Yes. And you can make out where the church was. Yes, yes. Well, and indeed, oftentimes what happened is those buildings, and again, needing to make sure we're not wasting the resources. I know some good friends that I see in the back who know what that's like when you take those old things and make new. But, um, yes. Moving churches, moving the Gaffield School over here so that we have it. Uh, using, uh, I think, the Amble, one of the Amble churches of the three in the little village. Harry Clue, who was a grocer back in the 40s and 50s in Lakeview, picked it up. I mean, you know, moved it by conveyance to Lakeview and it started the Lutheran Church there. So it's interesting to think about the history in buildings. Some of them maybe um, have more story to it like the one you mentioned. And what's that Westville church used for now? Well, they made it into a sheep shed and a hot house. There you go. <laughs> but you, you still can make up the church. Yeah. And the south side has four windows. Yeah. Maybe back where the pulpit was, there's a big window. Yeah. And on the one side, there's like a four-foot door. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's a loft, too. There's a yeah. loft. Maybe, maybe there's some good preaching to that congregation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. The uh, uh, Pleasant Hill uh, School that you talked about uh, is still a school, and it, uh, it's used by the Amish uh, during the week. And I think uh, occasionally they hold uh, uh, religious services on the weekends. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that walls could tell and talk. <laughs> you know. And I think it's that um, we were talking as Milo was coming with us, Milo Harvey, about um, Agnes. Um, no, um, that's her. Dorothea Jorgensen, who wrote so much about that school mm -hmm. and, yes. and all of those memories from your yeah. yeah. Were you paid through the Methodists or contributions? Oh, that, and that, that's good. I should have probably brought that up some. Um, Ed Moore paid my great grandpa with a lot of potatoes. <laughs> I have a day book uh, that he kept. It's kind of a large format list of preaching he did in all of these places every Sunday, what the mess, what the text was, and then on the next page an offering. And so, you know, it's in the, you know, a dollar fifty, uh, you know, eighty-five cents. I mean, we're talking that, you know, having a lot of cash money was not as possible, but there was always provision. Now, definitely, I don't think Great Grandpa ever said he had um, uh, deer lungs, dry <laughs> veins, <laughs> and baby disease. Um, but, uh, but I do remember a pastor friend who had somebody um, make uh, some uh, make a pie, and I think she kept the flour in the same uh, vicinity as some um, 
Waffles? <laughs> and so, when, uh, if, you know, when she asked the next Sunday, and she said, uh, did you like the pie? <laughs> you know, did you like the pie? And he just uh, very honestly said, you know, man, you know, a pie like that doesn't last long in our house. <laughs> Like that, you could have everybody. 
you know, and, it, and, 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 and yet this circuit writer comes trying to offer, you know, some hope. Other, other thoughts or questions? I know that went on a little long, but preachers can do that. Um, kids find the children, did they stay at home while he went around? If, if, if we go to my great-grandfather, um, that was a much more settled ministry than the ones I described that had 200 miles to do. Um, and so let's just take um, Lakeview, for example. Oh, no, we could go to Edmore. That'd be a better example. They had two young girls, and, and, and he would preach at Edmore, and then he would go down the road and preach at McBride, and then I think probably just a little bit further, he'd come over to Hemingway, uh, and that might even be Sunday afternoon. Um, I think... I think my grandma, I know later she did, but I think my grandma was probably someone who maybe even wanted to go with him. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes, she, in later years, she'd go and she'd sing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have one just charming story uh, about one of her last uh, days in this world as she was at an um, adult foster care home in, in Lakeview. And I remember Cindy and I were visiting her and sitting close to her bed so that she could hear us. And then I was going to... I said, Grandma, Grandma, Cindy and I are here. And then she went, shh, shh. She said, they're having the benediction. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but again, I, uh, in, in that day and age, they're definitely, you know, and Cindy and I can tell you that, yeah. you know, we serve in our first parish three churches. Okay. Um, so he wasn't gone for six weeks at no, a time. No, no, no. They would be, they would be just, just in the circuit of that morning. And Cindy, you know, bless her heart, when we first married, she went to all three. She heard me say the same thing three times. She, in fact, she, in fact, in the last church, because, because you're about windblown by the time you get to the last church, you know, when services are at nine, ten, and eleven, because they're depending on horses under the hood and not underneath you. And so, and so, you know, 9, 10, and 11, by the time I got to that last church, I was windblown and everything. So Cindy would sit in the back, and she'd give me signals, like a third base coach. And, and you know, just help me, you know, maybe my glasses were a little off, or maybe my hair was standing up, or, you know, my, my stole often was, you know, I was wearing a rope, so the stole was akimbo. And so one Sunday, I was up there, and I watched her, and she, you know, I was, she was making signs like I was going to see the ball. And I, you know, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm trying while I'm preaching to, you know, brush my hair back and, and then, you know, kind of rub my face and touch my nose and, you know, I was just watching, I was preaching, you know, doing all of that. And, and then at the end, I, I, I said to her after people had been greeting, greeted, I said, Cindy, what, what was wrong? And then she just kind of asked mind and said, oh, was I? <laughs>